Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. You are about to experience one of the most terrifying half hours in your entire life. Three Skeleton Key, starring Vincent Price. Oh, yes, I realize superlatives tend to lose their significance by overuse. How many times have you been promised that a story would be the funniest or the most dramatic or the most exciting, only to find that it failed to live up to its advertising? The story you are about to hear is an exception. It is unconditionally guaranteed to chill your blood unless you happen to love rats. We begin now with Mr. Vincent Price in Three Skeleton Key, a play well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Picture this place. A gray tapering cylinder welded by iron rods and concrete to the key itself. A bare black rock 150 feet long, maybe 40 wide. That's at low tide. At high tide, just the light rising 110 feet straight up out of the ocean. And all about it, the churning water, gray-green, scum-dappled, warm as soup and swarming with gigantic bat-like devilfish, great violet schools of Portuguese man-o-war, and, yes, sharks, the big ones, the 15-footers. And as if this wasn't enough, there was a hot, dank, rotten-smelling wind that came at us day and night off the jungle swamps of the mainland. A wind that smelled like death. Set in the base of the light was a watertight bronze door. In you went and up. Yes, up and up and round and round. Past the tanks of oil and the coils of rope. Cases of wicks, racks of lanterns, sacks of spuds and cartons and cans. And up and up and up, round and round. Over the light storeroom was the food storeroom, and over the food storeroom was the bunk room where the three of us slept. And over the bunk room was the living and cooking room. And over the living and cooking room was the light. She was a beauty, balanced like a ballerina on the glistening steel axle of her rotary mechanism. At night, you'd lie there on the stone deck of the gallery with her revolving smoothly and quietly over your head, easing her bright white eye 360 degrees around the horizon. You'd lie there watching to see that the feeders kept working, that everything ran right. <laughs> and it wouldn't be bad. The other two fellows snoring in their sacks two levels down. <laughs> you'd smoke your pipe to kill the stink of the wind. It wouldn't be bad. About those other two, Louis and August. What a pair. Louis, he was head man, was a big fellow from the Basque country, black beard, little hard black eyes, and a pair of arms that I tell you, those arms were as big around as my legs. Yeah? <laughs> Head man he was, and what word he let go was law. A silent fellow, and although I spent my first two weeks trying to strike up a real conversation, the most I could ever get uh, out of him was... I took up this profession because I, I, I don't like people. They talk too much. It's... Quiet work, light tending. Let's keep it that way. Understand? You you are getting to be as bad as August. I thought maybe that was well, Louis. And when he accused me of becoming like August, I quieted down because August was the talkingest man I've ever met, the talkingest and the ugliest. He was hunchbacked, stood four feet high, had red hair and big blue eyes. 
It seems he'd been an actor in Paris. Played in over 200 different productions, dear boy. That's a grand guignol. Oh, but it was monstrous. Horrible. In the way we used to scare the audience. <laughs> I, I was hated. Yes, yes. They used to throw things and hiss and, and bare their teeth at me. Well, finally, it got too bad. I... I couldn't stand it any longer. No, I gave up the theater. My nerves, you understand. Yes, I gave it up completely. I really did. I couldn't stand it any longer. It all started one morning at 2.30. I was on watch, lying on the cool stone deck pulling on my pipe, staring out at the blackness, the phosphorescent combers, and the big yellow stars, when out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something show up for a second, something the light had touched far off. I waited for her to come around again, and when she did, there it was. A three-master, a big one, about a half mile off, and Coming down out of the nor-nor-west, coming straight for us. You, know, you must understand, our light was where it was for a very good reason. Dangerous submerged reefs surrounded us and ships kept clear. But this one, this sailing vessel, was coming straight on. I went over to the gallery door and yelled, Louis! Louis! What? Ship headed for the reefs! Coming right up! I had the glasses out now. Couldn't read her name, but I could see her quite plainly. All sails set, the foam creaming away under her bow, her beautiful lines. A Dutch ship, I guessed her. But why didn't she turn? Every time it passed, our light hit her with the glare of day. Ship? Where? No, no, west. The light will touch her in a moment. Can't they see? Look at her. She just keeps coming on. The square heads. What is it? What, what is it? Watch no no west. I know. I know what it is. What? The Dutchman. The flying Dutchman. She's derelict. That's it. Derelict? The abandoned. The crew left her for some reason or other, but instead of sinking, she's gone on, running before every wind. She'll not run long. Not with these reefs to break her up. Beautiful ship. Now, why would men leave a beautiful ship like that? We watched her the rest of those black hours, heeling and rocking, pushed and pulled by every stray wind, every freak current. Watched her until the dawn came, till the sea turned from black to a pearly gray. And on she came again, heading for us. We all had our glasses trained on her now. August, you can kill the light. Right, Chief. She doesn't look so good by daylight. Do you think she'll ground this time? I say, do you think she'll ground this time? This is impossible. Absolutely impossible. Why? Here, take my glasses. They're stronger than yours. All right. What is it? You... I had to focus and then... My breath froze in my throat. The decks were swarming with a dark brown carpet that looked like a gigantic fungus, but undulating. And on the masts and yards, the guys and all were hundreds, no, thousands, no, I don't know, an inestimable number of tremendous rats. See them? Yes, yes, I see them. Now we know why she's a derelict. Yes, now we know. What are you two doing here? Give me a look. Yeah, yes, give him the glasses. Uh, Take a good look, Chatterbox. Huh? Give you something to talk about. She's still heading for us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, look, if she's going to turn, uh, she'd better turn soon. Uh, suppose she doesn't. You mean suppose she piles up on the key? It's low tide. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, it is. Well, where's all the conversation? Oogies? No! Huh? No! She's still coming on. 
Go away. Turn. Go away. Turn, will you turn? I say, I pray you turn. Cracked up. <laughs> Rats, look. On the water, like a carpet. Swimming. Sure, they're swimming. Those are ship rats. They're swimming for the rocks. <laughs> the door below, it's open. Yes, come on. <laughs> down he went, racing down the stone stairs, taking them three and four at a time. Scared. You can bet we were scared. Oh, this, you get the windows. Maybe they can climb. We don't know. Right, Chief, but hurry. Hurry. <laughs> See them? No. Oh, oh, yes, I do, yes. Up at the other end of the rock. Look at them. Me! They smell us. Here they come. Close the door. I can't. It's stuck. Oh, here, let me... You move me. You move. You made it. Holy. That was close. One got in. Look, there. We'll get him. Watch it. He's kicking. What? Oh, what a brute. It's as big as a tomcat. Bigger. His eyes were wild and red, his teeth long and sharp and yellow. He went for a starving, ravenous. And we fought him, fought that one rat all over the room. It was all, believe me, I do not exaggerate. It was like fighting a panther. Got him. We'd better get aloft. Yes. We ran up the winding staircase. We passed the tiny windows of the various levels. And at every one, every one was a thick, wriggling, screaming curtain of brown fur. I was ahead of Louis, and I dreaded each successive level. Suppose they had found a way in. Look at them. Oh, will you look at them? It's a nightmare. Will you look at them? The air of the gallery was thick and fetid with the stink of them. The light was dim brown, filtered through the crawling mass that swarmed over the glass all about us. We could not see the sky, nothing, nothing but them. Their red eyes, their claws, their wriggling hairy snouts and their teeth. The rats, they screamed and howled and threw themselves against the glass. They were starving and we three, we stood quietly, very, very quietly in the center of the glass room under our beautiful light. What can we do? What can we do, Chief? Take it easy, Yogi. No, no, Take it me. easy. It, it won't do any good. It won't do any good to stand here and shake. That's right. Go away. Go away. Do you hear me? Go away this instant. They won't go away. Not until... <laughs> Finish it, Chief. Not until what? Not until they've been fed. You can take just so much horror and then you get used to it. And they were interesting to watch, you know. They couldn't understand the glass. <laughs> they could see us and they could rush at us, but that thin, invisible barrier held them off, stopped them. From time to time, we caught a glimpse of the rocks below. More rats down there, swarming brown velvet in the bright tropical sunlight. And then the tide began to rise. If only it had drowned some of them. Ship rats don't drown. You can't drown one of them. Look, they're all climbing up the tower. Yeah, this bunch around us is getting thicker. Mm. See, what's the time, huh? <laughs> Quarter of six. You've got first watch. Uh, yes, wait that's right. Ten. I will. I will. Come along, August. It was getting dark. One side of the room was lit a soft, filtered red. Sun set through the rats. Oh, very pretty. <laughs> I set the wicks, checked my fuel, and then lit the lamp. The coffin lit them in their gigantic wriggling web of pale, hairless bellies, twitching red tails, bright eyes. And then I started the rotary motor. The 
light drove them mad. As she swung slowly and smoothly about, she blinded them in the fierce stabbing bar of light, moving continually about, ever turning, ever touching, ever moving around and around, and they twitching and shuddering, eyes flaming when they were struck by the light, the bright light moving and behind on the dark side of the room, so close, so close. I dared not turn my back, which cannot help turning your back when you are in a room made of glass. On the dark side of the room, you could not see them but only their eyes, thousands of points of blank red light, blinking and twinkling like the stars of hell. Louis relieved me at ten. But as you may imagine, I didn't get much sleep that night. And when I came up into the gallery early the next morning, there stood Auguste. He was bowing to the rat. Waving his arms, and so help me, uh, making one, a speech. My dear audience, I am going to play once again that magnificent role which made me the toast of the Paris theater. Prelati, the evil genius of the medieval underworld. <laughs> I am he who did guide the dark soul of the Marachal into the nether paths. <laughs> Do not be frightened, little children. I will not hurt you much. <laughs> he kept Come turning. I stood staring at him, horror struck, but he didn't notice me. The man had gone mad. He kept turning, telling his stories to all the rats, leaving not one out. August! August! Ah, another one, a latecomer. Take a seat on the aisle, dear Patrick. Oh, no, stop it, stop it! <laughs> he didn't stop. He went on, bowing and scraping to the rats, his big blue eyes rolling and winking, his wild red hair waving about him. I grabbed him by the arm and slapped his face. He looked at me like a child, and then his face screwed up. He looked as though he were about to cry. Go below, August. Go on. Oh, very well, then. <laughs> Later, my dear audience. Later. <laughs> Matinee today. <laughs> sure, he was crazy. But I guess we all were. A few hours later, he came back up and caught Louie and me teasing the rats. Yes, sounds horrible. <laughs> it, it was fun. We would get right up against the glass and make faces at them. It drove them crazy. They would scratch away, try to get at our eyes. <laughs> Louie was even cuter about it. He'd pull a piece of bread out of his pocket and press it against the glass. The rats would scramble into a solid ball, biting each other, clustering like, like grapes. From time to time, a whole knot of them would slip and fall 110 feet to the surf below. Look! Look, look at the sharks. They're <laughs> eating them. No, those sharks are our friends. <laughs> here, here. Mm. I'll get another bunch together. <laughs> here, my beauty. That's it. I'll, um, kill each other. <laughs> there they go. <laughs> August joined in, too. Oh, oh very ingenious, August. <laughs> He learned that if he spread-eagled himself against the glass, they'd bunch and bundle against his figure. Then he'd leap back. Look! My portrait in rats! <laughs> it went on all day, and then I was lying in bed. It was about midnight. I was very tired, and I was just beginning to fall off to sleep when I became conscious of a new sound. I couldn't figure it at first. I got up, lit the lamp, and went to the window. Even as I looked at it, I saw one of the panes begin to sag in. They had eaten the wood away. Louis, Louis, come quick. What? What? What they, is it? they found a way in. I held the glass with my hand. 
Now they were all going crazy, and assured of the success of this maneuver, they were all nibbling away at the wood. Louis ran below and then returned with a large sheet of tin. He spread it against the window and hammered it into place. Even as we did so, I, I felt the heavy bodies thudding against the other side as the window gave way. Uh, that ought to hold. If it doesn't, we're done for. Rats can't eat tin. No, no, they can't. What? What was that? I don't know. It came from below. The storeroom window. They're in. They're swarming up the stairs. Drop the trap. Light. Two of them got in. Go after them. We didn't have to go after them. They came at us. I let you one side and grabbed a marlin spike, swung and smashed one in midair. I whirled to see Louis with the other. It had ripped his hand open and the blood was pouring all over the place. He held his hand aloft and kicked at the snarling rat. I stepped and swung and got him. My hand. He's got my hand. That's the brother of them, Louis. I'll oh, get you something blood. to tie that up. Blood, look at it, my blood. I'm, I'm bleeding. Don't worry about it, Louis. Don't worry. Now, here, look. I'll wind this kerchief around it. It'll be okay. Blood. Oh. There, there, there. Blood. No, no, no. It's not bad, just the flesh. My blood. Then I became conscious of a new sound. They were gnawing their way through the wooden trap door. I watched the planks fascinated, and even as I did, it began to give way. A bristling, whiskery snout showed through. Louis! Louis, we've got to go up! The next level was the living quarters and kitchen. I slammed the flat there, too, but it, too, was wood. Well, my blood, what are we going to I, do? I don't know. They'll be through this one in a moment. The gallery. The trap door in the gallery is metal. Good! Come on! <laughs> Oh, we made it. We made it. We lay across the trap, exhausted, while below us the rats took over the entire tower. I could hear them howling and fighting over our food supply, our water, our leather, and all about us the others screamed and glared in at us, swayed in a tangled mess, hypnotized by the ever-turning light. <laughs> By morning, the air in the little room was horrible. To now, we'd been getting air from the tower below. Now that was sealed off. And so was all our food and water. We lay exhausted, panting, waiting, waiting. And the hours crawled on. I, I was almost dozing from fatigue when I saw a sight that brought me too fast. <laughs> Would you like to come in, my beauty? Yes, uh, will you? <laughs> I hold the powers of life and death, and I can let you in, you know. Auguste was standing by the glass, and in one hand he held a big wrench. He was tapping the glass gently, not quite hard enough to break it. I eased myself to my feet and slowly, very slowly, I tiptoed toward him. All I have to do is just a little harder and I found a coil of wire in the tool kit and I trussed him up, fastened him to a stanchion in the center of the room. Louis was of no help. He lay on his side looking at his bloody hand, weak and sick as a baby. So there I was, a lunatic and a coward for company, and all about watching our little drama, The Rats. The day dragged by. The supply boat wasn't due for another 12 days. I don't know what they could have done if they had come. And we had only one way of summoning them. That was to shoot off distress rockets, but the rockets were four floors below. And even if they'd been right there in the gallery, I, I couldn't have opened a window to fire them. 
That night I tended the light, but its flame was devouring our oxygen. The following day we lay, thirst tormented, starving, waiting, waiting. The following night I again tended the light, but the small supply of spare wicking we kept in the gallery had become exhausted, and quite suddenly, at about midnight, the light went out. There was nothing I could do. Wicks were stored three levels below. Nothing I could do, nothing. From time to time, I'd strike a match to see the clock. And when I did, it lit up the million red eyes about us. All about us, watching, waiting. Below, it had grown quiet. They'd cleaned us out, and now they, too, were waiting. All waiting. And then, the rats, quite suddenly, were silent. And then I heard it. And then I saw the sky and the stars. The rats were gone. I went to the glass. Out there on the water, a small freighter, a banana boat showing a few lights, came softly and innocently at us. The light was out. They didn't know. I, I wanted to open the windows to call out to them, to warn them somehow, but, but I was afraid. What if the rats were hiding from me, tricking me? So I waited. She grounded very softly on a reef not 200 yards from the quay. Grounded so gently that the man playing the cornet was he a passenger, a crewman off watch, didn't even stop playing. They tried washing her back off. I could have told them to save their fuel. The tide was rising, would have floated her free. And I waited. Well, that's all. That's the story. The sun came up and there wasn't a rat on the whole key. Every last one of that terrible army had deserted us. Gone back to sea on their new ship. August? Insane asylum, he never recovered. Louis, they took him into Cayenne where he died of blood poisoning from his bite. Life on three skeleton key isn't bad these days. <laughs> but sometimes when I see a strange vessel approaching, I get a little nervous. Sure. Somewhere on the seas, there's a little banana boat without a crew. That is, without a human crew. <laughs> Suspense, in which Vincent Price starred in Three Skeleton Key with John Daner and Ben Wright. Suspense. Suspense was directed in Hollywood by William N. Robeson. Three Skeleton Key was adapted by James Poe from the story by George G. Tudus. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the original score. Sound pattern by Cliff Thorsness, Gus Bays, and Ray Kemper. George Walsh speaking. Suspense is presented by the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. National Broadcasting Company presents Lights Out, a summer revival of the famous series which many of our listeners will remember. Tonight's story, the eighth and the last in this series, is called The Signalman. 
Lights out. Everybody. This is the witching hour. The hour when dogs howl and evil is let loose on the sleeping world. Sit in the dark now and listen to Lights Out. Hello, below there. I was calling to a man who stood beside a railroad track at the bottom of a deep and rocky ravine. One would have thought that, considering the nature of the ground, he would have looked up to where I was standing. But instead he turned and looked down the railroad line. I called again. Hello, below there. Because the terrible glare of the setting sun was in my eyes... I put my left arm across my face and waved to him with my right. He looked up and and I saw in his face an expression of intense horror. He regarded me fixedly without moving. And I shouted, Is there a path by which I can come down and speak to you? He continued to stare at me. Gradually, the expression of horror seemed to pass from his face leaving it a gray, empty mask. When he spoke, his voice seemed to come from a grave. Why do you wish to speak to me? No reason. Just want to talk. If you have no reason, then please go on your way. Well, I do have a reason. Uh, Let me come down and talk to you. He motioned with his little rolled-up flag to a narrow path about 200 yards distant, which descended the rocky wall of the ravine. I carefully made my way down it. The ravine was extremely deep and unusually precipitate. The man's post at the bottom was in as solitary and dismal a place as I'd ever seen. I could see the railroad tracks running into a dark, gloomy tunnel at one end of it. So little sunlight ever found its way to the spot that it had an earthy, deadly smell. And so much cold wind rushed through that it struck chill into me, as though I'd left the mortal world. Hello. I'm... I'm afraid I'm intruding. Well? I'd... I'd better explain. You see, I'm a reporter for the London Times. You know the Times. Yes. I know the Times. I'm a new man. I was assigned to do a series of stories on... on people who work at little-known occupations in the city. And strolling along, seeing you down here, I thought... Well, I thought, here is a story. And that's the reason that brought you down here... Yes, uh, perhaps I'd better ask you a few questions, hadn't I? For instance, how far down are we? I've never seen anything quite like this before. Fifty-two feet. Is that considered deep for railroad cutting? Deepest in the country. Fifty-two feet. Hmm? And and how long is the tunnel? Three quarters of a mile. I see. And that red signal light in front of the tunnel, is that part of your job? I mean, do you have to see that it stays lighted all the time? Don't you know that it is? Don't I know it is? Look, you've been staring at me ever since... Well, ever since I called to you. Staring as though I were something to be afraid of. (laughs) I'm just a newspaper reporter, that's all. I thought I'd seen you before. Seen me? But where? There. By that signal light. But I've never been here before. It's a part of London I've never visited. No, you may be sure of that. Perhaps I may. Yes, I'm sure I may. I beg your pardon for being so unfriendly. It's just that... Well, I made a mistake. That's all right. I shouldn't have come down, I suppose. After I saw this unusual ravine in the tunnel and your job down here, I felt I had to come down and talk to you. I think I'm glad you did. I have very little company. This is a world here different from other men's worlds. I can believe that. May I ask 
What exactly is the nature of your job? I mean, besides keeping the signal light burning and flagging the trains, what do you have to do? Not very much. I operate the telegraph in my hut over there. Turn this iron handle now and then. That's all. And you're down here all the time? Yes. Don't you ever get a chance to take a few minutes off and get up there on top in the sunlight? Very seldom. I can't leave the telegraph. Oh, by the way, I have a fire in my signal house. Wouldn't you like to come in and warm yourself? Oh, indeed I would. This, this wind cuts right through me. We'll hurry along. There. This will be better. Yes. I'll just put a little more wood on the fire, poke it down. How do you stand that wind? I'm about frozen. I've been here eight or nine years, maybe ten. I'm used to the wind. It never changes. Here, take this chair close to the fire. Oh, thank you. Tell me, don't you ever feel cut off from the world? Almost as though you were marooned and isolated down here? Yes, I do. This is a world in itself, down here. It's as wide as the tunnel is, and as high. Those are the boundaries of my world. For one hour, sometimes less, the sunlight falls into it. And at night I see the bright stars, as other men do. But that is all our two worlds hold in common. But why did you ever take such a job? Because I... Oh, excuse me. A message. Certainly. 615 Roxboro, ten minutes late. Received message. All's well. Do you know, after talking to you, I feel as though I've at last met with a completely contented man. I believe I used to be so at one time. But now, I'm worried. Worried. About what? I don't know. It's... Uh... Uh, difficult to explain. Perhaps I can help you. I've been thinking of that. I've been wondering. Tell me. I've got to tell someone. And yet... Uh, uh, give me some time to think it over. Say, until tomorrow night, perhaps then. You mean, you'd like me to come back? Yes. If it wouldn't be too much trouble. I'll be here. About the same time. But why not now? Why can't you tell me now? I want to think it over in my mind first. I want to be sure. Uh, meanwhile, let me light your way to the path. Oh. Yes, of course. Uh, don't forget your pad and oh. pencil. Thank you. Oh. Dark, isn't it? Yes, be careful. Everything gets damp and slippery down here at this time of the night. Oh. I didn't think 52 feet would make such a difference in atmosphere. There's the path, and let me ask one favor of you. Yes? When you reach the top, don't call out. Very well. And tomorrow when you come, don't call out. Tell me, what made you cry out hello below there tonight? I don't know. Did I cry something to that effect? Not to that effect. Those were the very words. I know them well. I suppose I said them because... Because I saw you below. With your left hand across your face and your right arm raised. The sunset was in my eyes. That was the only reason? <laughs> what other reason could I possibly have? You had no feeling that the words and gesture were conveyed to you in any supernatural way? No, of course not. I see. Well, good night, then. I'll see you tomorrow night. Yes. Yes, tomorrow night. That night, I slept poorly. Or rather, I didn't sleep. Because the man's face was constantly before me. And there was something in the eyes of fear, a wordless crying, agony of spirit that 
fevered my own brain and wouldn't let me rest. All night long I watched the face and behind it was the sun going down in flames beyond the ravine and a figure which I recognized as myself, one arm shading the eyes, the other waving and standing in the ravine and shouting, Hello below there! In the morning, my landlady awakened me. She said I'd been crying out in my sleep all night. Throughout that day, I worked with one eye on the clock, counting the hours until my appointment with the signal man. At last it came. The sun was going down again as I made my way down the path into the dank and unworldly ravine. He was waiting for me at the bottom with his white light. I didn't call to you. It's as you asked. I'm glad you didn't. I was waiting for you. Come along. We'll go into the hut and talk. It's warm there. Good. I'm glad you came. At times during the day, I feared you wouldn't. I promised you. Yes. I've made up my mind to tell you the story. Hmm. The whole thing. Sit down. Thank you. But before I do, tell me. Do you believe that I am in my right mind? Yes. Yes, I believe that. All right. Do you remember yesterday evening the fact that I took you for someone else? Yes. That's what's troubling me. The mistake you mean? No. There's someone else I took you for. Who is he? I don't know. Well, does he look like me? I don't know. I've never seen his face. You see, the left arm is across the face, always. And the right arm is waved violently this way. It's as though he were trying to signal me. For God's sake, clear the way. Where do you see him? Uh, I may as well start at the beginning. One moonlight night about a year ago, I was sitting here when I heard a voice cry out, Hello, Hello there. It was just as you called last evening. I jumped up and looked out of the door and saw this... Uh, this someone else standing by the red light near the tunnel, waving, just as you did last night. One arm across the face, the other waving towards you? Yes, the voice seemed hoarse with shouting, and it cried, Look out! Look out! And then again, Hello, below there, look out! I caught up my lamp, turned it on, and ran toward this figure. What's wrong, I said? What's happened? It didn't speak stood just outside the blackness of the tunnel. I advanced so close upon it that I wondered it's keeping the, the arms across the eyes. I ran right up to it and had my hand outstretched to pull the arm away when it was gone. Uh, gone? Where? I don't know. I ran on into the tunnel, 500 yards maybe. I stopped and held my lamp over my head. And all I saw were the wet stains trickling down the walls. I ran out faster than I'd run in, searched the area with my light, and then came back here and, and called Burnham and said the alarm had been given anything wrong. They answered, all's well. Disregard alarm message. Well, don't you suppose you could have imagined seeing him? Yes, but you forget. I also heard him. Yes, but listen to the wind whistling through the tunnel. It sounds almost human at times. It's possible to well, imagine. Let me finish. You haven't heard the rest. Within six hours after the appearance, six hours, mind you, the 240 train came through the tunnel, slowed down and stopped. The engineer signaled me and I hurried up to the cab. What's the matter? No, no. One of the conductors signaled for a stop. Everything all right here? Yes, just got the all clear signal. Here comes the conductor now. Hello. What's wrong back there? What did you pull the cord for? An accident. Where's the signalman around here? That's me. You have a shack nearby. Right over there. Uh, what happened, man? A woman was killed. Killed? Oh, she was passing between the coaches. I suppose she slipped, was caught between the couplings. What hell? Nobody seems to know, sir. She was crushed horribly. On account of the other passengers, we've got to get the body off. Have them take her to my shack. You have them take her. From the shock when one morning, just as day was breaking, I looked toward the red signal light and saw him again. Did he cry out this time? No. 
He was silent. Did he wave his arm? Yes, the right one. The left, as usual, was across his eyes. He seemed to be pointing down into the tunnel. He leaned against the shaft of the light like a... like a statue over a grave. Did anything happen? Any accident? Anything? Not immediately. He was there. I saw him. Then he was gone. I waited for the hours to pass. And when six hours went by and nothing had happened, I began to feel relieved. By nightfall, I had almost forgotten it and was able to read quite calmly as the hours passed. I was sitting here reading, the door open, when I heard a train. It was the midnight express from Brighton. I recognized the whistle. I got out my flag, stepped to the door. I could hear them for miles beyond the tunnel entrance. I listened to the wheels, filling the night with their driving, pounding, rhythmic beat. And I thought of the people on the train, the tired, worn-out picnickers and weekenders returning from Brighton. It made me feel responsible for them, as though I were their guardian and keeper. I listened to the rhythmic beat of the wheels. The train was nearing the tunnel mouth. I listened to the regular, powerful beat of them, and then suddenly I realized that they weren't regular. There was no rhythm, only the terrible raging cry of a machine that has suddenly broken through its own power and is heading for destruction. It was the worst wreck on the line. They brought the dead and dying in here. They laid them at the place where he stood waving to me that very morning. And this was the second accident after you'd seen him? Yes. And the thing that is worrying me now, he came back again a week ago. Oh. Ever since he's been there now and again by fits and starts. Standing by the left. Yes. What does he seem to do? The left arm is over the face. The right arm is waving. He seems to be trying to say, for God's sake, clear the way. I can't believe it. I have no peace or rest from it. It calls to me for many minutes together in a frightful manner. Below there, look out, look out. He stands waving to me. Well, have you seen it tonight? No. Not yet. But will you come to the door with me and look for it now? Yes. Yes, I will. Do you see it? No. It's not there. Then let's go back. wasn't there now, but it may be there a moment from now. What troubles me is, what does this specter mean? What is the danger? Where is the danger? There is danger overhanging somewhere on this line. Some dreadful calamity is about to happen. It's not to be doubted this third time after what has gone before. But what can I do? Nothing that I can see. If I telegraph danger, I can give no reason for it. I should get into trouble and do no one any good. They would think I was mad. I would wire danger, take care. And they would answer, what danger, where? And I would have to wire back, don't know, but for God's sake, take care. And they would, of course, discharge me. What else could they do? Yes, I, I see. When it first stood under that light, why didn't it tell me? She is going to die. Let them keep her at home. When it came the second time. Why didn't it tell me how the accident could have been averted? If it came on those occasions only to show me that its warnings were true, why doesn't it warn me plainly now? Why doesn't it tell me what is going to happen so that I can change it? Listen, there's nothing you can do. Or rather, you're doing the only thing that any sane, normal person would do, and that's nothing. The important thing is to keep your balance now. Don't get worked up to the point that... That if you need to act later, you won't be able to. Yes. You're right. Of course you're right. You're doing your job as well as it's humanly possible to do. 
You're not responsible for the future. You're responsible only for the present. What happens at this switch now? You've got to look at it that way. I know. I know. Only I can't forget that something is going to happen. I don't doubt that. But if you keep your eyes open at all times, you may be able to prevent it. I pray to God I may. It's easy to say, but... But try not to think about it too much. I try. But it's the responsibility that crushes me. Because of this spectre, because of this knowledge of things that will happen along this line... I, I am responsible for every child, every mother, every person that rides upon it. I know that something is going to happen. I ought to warn them, but I don't know how to warn them when they die. If they die, their deaths are on my shoulders. Look, would you like me to spend the rest of the night with you? Perhaps it would help keep your mind off things. No, no. No, no, thank you. I, I'll, I'll be all right. You... You don't know what a blessing it's been just to be able to tell you the whole story. Would you like me to come back tomorrow night? Would you mind? No. And when you write your story about me, about this job... Yes? If you could tell the whole story, everything, everything I've told you, it would help lift this awful responsibility from my shoulders. People would know, then. They might think me mad, but they would know. And the weight would be from my spirit... Yes, I'll write that story tomorrow. Everything. You needn't be afraid that I'll skip anything. I'll bring it along with me and show it to you before I turn it in. It would mean so much. Yes. Now, uh, I think it's best that I go. Good night, then. And you will come back tomorrow? Oh, yes. Can you find the path? Easily. I'm beginning to know it by heart now. Good night. I went to bed immediately after returning to my lodgings. If I had slept unsoundly the night before, I slept little, if any, this night. There were the same dreams, the man's face, his eyes with their deep inner secret and pain, and in the background the sun going down over the ravine, and the figure, no longer my own, with one arm across the eyes and the other waving toward me, crying in a low moan, Clear the way! Clear the way! In the morning, when I came to work, I felt tired, almost feverish. I hardly, could hardly wait until sundown when I would again visit the signalman. I wanted to show him the story as I'd written it. At last, the hands of the clock pointed to 6.30, and I left the office on my way to the ravine. About half an hour later, I arrived at the top of the cutting. I glanced down, and there, close at the mouth of the tunnel, I saw a man, his left arm across his eyes, passionately waving his right arm... But the nameless horror that oppressed me passed in a moment, for I saw that this man was a man indeed, and that there was a little group of other men standing at a short distance to whom he seemed to be rehearsing the gesture he made. With an irresistible sense that something was wrong, with the self-reproachful fear that fatal mischief had come of my leaving the man there alone in his state of mind the night before, I descended the rocky path with all the speed I could make and, and ran up to the crowd. What's the matter here? Signalman killed. When? Just a little while ago. Not the man belonging to this post? Aye. Not the man I know. You will recognize him, sir, if you are a friend to him. The body is over here. There. You see? Oh. How did it happen? He was cut down by the engine, sir. Just as he was lighting that red lamp. No man on the line knew his work better. But somehow he wasn't clear of the outer rail. He had the lamp in his hand ready to light it as the engine came out of the tunnel. His back was toward it and she caught him down. Ah, here's the engineer now. Tom, show him how it happened. Yes, how did it happen? I'm a reporter from the time. Well, sir, coming around the curve in the tunnel, I saw him at the end. There was no time to check the speed, but I always knew him to be very careful. Only this time, he didn't seem to pay any attention to the whistle. I finally shut it off when we were running down on him and called out to him. What did you say? I shouted, 
Hello below there. For God's sake, clear the way. No. Yes, sir. That I shouted. How oh, it was a terrible thing, sir. I never left off calling to him. Finally, I... I put my left arm across the eyes so that I wouldn't have to see. And I waved his arm to the last. But it was no use, sir. No use. No use. I walked away. I was trembling so that it took all my efforts to climb the rocky path to the top of the ravine. I knew the sun was going down in flames behind me, but I dared not look. I hurried back to my desk at the office and began writing the tragic end of the story. Sir? Yes, boy? Is your copy ready, sir? In just a moment. Please hurry, sir. Piper goes to press in a half hour. I'll have it ready. Come back in a few minutes. All right, sir. This, then, is the story as it was told to me and as I saw it. I make no judgment of it. No deductions. It happened. I know it happened. That is all. Except I bear with me the memory of a humble man, lonely and isolated from this world of ours, one who bore the responsibility for his fellow men so strongly on his conscience that he died from it. For I am convinced that that alone is what brought him to this end, not the train which was merely an instrument of fate. Signed. Charles Dickens. All right. You can turn them on now. You have just heard the eighth and the last in the summer series of Lights Out. Tonight's story, Charles Dickens, The Signalman, was adapted for radio by Frederick J. Lipp. Starring in the role of Charles Dickens was Nelson Olmsted. The signalman was played by Herb Butterfield. Others in the cast included Boris Apland, Nathan Davis, and Jess Pugh. And now it's time to turn the lights out for the summer. We've enjoyed bringing you these shows, and if we've managed to send a few chills up and down your spine, well, that's what we set out to do. Beginning next week at this time, be sure to hear the new Judy Canova show, which returns to the air. You'll have the time of your life, so be sure to listen. Lights Out was produced and directed by Albert Cruz. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.